tonight. Uh, I had a group over to watch the debate uh, between the alleged moderates and uh, progressives, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, Marianne Williamson, all come to mind. And it was interesting how the AT&T owned CNN, uh, you know, completely controlled the oxygen of this event. It reminds me that back in the old days, the League of Women Voters would run these debates. Why do we have giant corporations like AT&T controlling CNN, deciding what we get to hear? And then the interesting aspect, of course, is that that creates a set of these um, questions, and they're, they're all very loaded questions. Um, questions about why do you want to take people's private insurance away? And in a Medicare for All system, um, everybody would have access to doctors, and um, all other countries have this that are modern industrialized countries with slight uh, variations, but Germany, uh, France, uh, Spain, um, uh, Canada, etc., have uh, uh, health care as a human right. So it seems to me that what they're really saying is that they, they like inequality. They like uh, having a system where I get better health care than everybody else, and everybody else got good health care. Maybe I wouldn't get as good health care. So the idea of raising everybody else up is a threat to the people at the top. And, um, you know, we have Anderson Cooper, uh, who had a, a nice chat with Marianne Williamson. Um, but this guy is a heir of the Mellon fortune. You know, uh, 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 Andrea Mitchell is married to uh, uh, Alan Greenspan. Um, these people who get on television are not paid normal salaries. They're not part of the 99%. They're part of the 1%. So the whole thing is controlled by a small elite. And uh, Chris Cuomo was really going after this persistently, taking away people's private health care. Uh, private health insurance. Uh, and I don't understand the obsession about this when we're talking about simply instituting the same policy that exists in every other country and that the U.S. has uh, at least a double cost of health care of any other country. And we have people dying, going bankrupt, um, and they act like this is a third rail issue. Um, and the general uh, anal analysis of these people, including Axelrod, Axelrod said that it will never, ever happen, uh, at least not in any reasonable span of time. And my criticism of the candidates, so, so to, to finish my criticism of these multimillionaires who control all the oxygen in the room about what we get to think about, is, you know, you wonder about their motivation. So is the motivation that they want a Democrat to win um, so that uh, their network will have access to the White House? Why do they want a Democrat to win when they're really interested in the stability of the status quo? And, of course, it doesn't occur to them that you could have a anti-establishment right-left alliance, which Ralph Nader has talked about, Ron Paul has certainly been supportive of, uh, this would be the ultimate uh, terror to them, would be to people who want to burn the system down on both the right and left getting together. It doesn't even occur to them in a million years because they see it as a spectrum of a radical left, then center left, uh, and then center right and radical right. Um, and when reality, it's the center is the establishment and the left and the right, radical left and right, are people that are not happy with the status quo. So, you know, my main concern with the candidates, they have to get elected, so they have to temper their message. But uh, these candidates did not really, I mean, describe in any detail what we're in for with climate change. Um, so one of the first, so, so the thing that is sickest well, all right. So first of all, we know that most of the large mammals are gone in the world. Uh, most species of rhino are gone. Um, most of the great apes are in very tiny populations now. Um, here in the Amer in North America, uh, you know, uh, the golden bear in California is wiped out long ago. The 
California grizzly was wiped out long ago. Uh, so we know that a lot of uh, these species are gone. We know that a lot of fisheries are gone. A lot of large fish are in very tiny populations now. So that's the first uh, evidence of something really wrong is losing nature. Then we know that the natural habitats have shrunk by 80%, 75%. Um, what else do we know? So then we have the melting of the poles. When the poles melt, you have less reflection of light. So the earth heats. Um, and we know that the poles are shrinking. We know that Greenland's ice mass is shrinking. We know that glaciers are shrinking. So that's the next shoe to drop. And that's called the albedo effect. The reflectivity of uh, the white snow and ice and its uh, size is is gradually shrinking. So the next shoe to drop after that is the burning of the boreal forests of the northern hemisphere. And so now we see that. We see the Siberia burning. And Siberia is particularly dangerous. I'm not sure this is happening, but Siberia has a lot of methane under the permafrost. So if there's uh, fires, it's also going to release methane. And methane is 10 times as powerful as CO2. And um, so we have the burning of the forests of the Northern Hemisphere. So we get to the point where, like in Germany, a third of the trees they've planted have burned. So an article came out recently saying that, oh, the solution to climate problem, CO2 in the atmosphere, um, is to plant more trees. So if we plant a trillion trees, we should be able to cancel out the effect of the cars and the, uh, the CO2. But the problem is, if things get to a certain point, the trees will just burn. So you're just creating fuel. I started smoking again when I went on a trip to Chile, and I will stop soon. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, so we've got the boreal forest burning. And so we're going to get to the point where some places that you'd like to plant trees are not going to be good to plant trees in because they'll just burn. Um, and then you can pick other types of trees. And then you have the problem that you now you're introducing on native species. Um, and then some people say that hemp is a great uh, form of uh, oxygen. It's not very water intensive. But uh, we have to plant these trees soon in the right places or they'll just burn. This is a problem of taking something that captures carbon into being a place that emits carbon. So I really think that we should have a website, at the very least, that shows exactly what the forecasts show for 2025 in terms of how many insects will be left, how much mammals will be left, how many fish will be left. And of course, we know we have this big problem with the ocean. It's a double-barreled problem. One problem is it's getting warmer and um, it's getting more acidic so that shells can't uh, form. Um, and we've got a third of Guam's coral reefs have been reported as uh, dead now. Um, more than a third of the Great Barrier Reef is dead. Uh, we have massive amounts of plastic in the oceans um, that are doing all sorts of terrible things to our um, friends who live in the ocean who uh, swallow the plastic. Um, and um, there's uh, and the ocean has captured 90% of this human uh, heat that we've created through increasing the CO2 level in the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, when the temperature goes up one degree on average, it's actually more like three degrees inland. And this is uh, often expressed in terms of Celsius. So we're talking five degrees. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing these incredible record temperatures. And crops lose their productivity when it gets too hot. So grain loses 10 or 20 percent of its nutritional value for every degree of Fahrenheit uh, that the average temperature goes up beyond some, you know, uh, ideal average. So what we're looking at is the inability to grow grains at scale. So we're looking at the loss of uh, billions of lives in the not-too-distant future, probably 
uh, 72, 20, 25, and 2035. So this idea of being carbon neutral at 2050 or 2040 or 2030, um, if you graph everything out, there's feedback loop. So the, once those northern forests burn, then the southern forests will begin to burn. So uh, that's the Amazon and the Congo and places like that. And it's complicated because um, the uh, climate predictions, for example, in California, is it will probably have severe droughts followed by very rainy periods. So the El Nino effect will get more intense. So California's forecast to actually get more rain, but I would I think what's going to happen is there will be three, four-year periods where there's no rain because weather is becoming persistent. It isn't. On the one hand, you have extreme weather events, but on the other hand, um, the atmosphere is slowing down. Um, and um, and so weather's supposed to get more persistent. So I, I really wish at the Democratic convention, Democratic debate for CNN, somebody had really described what we're in for, which is billions of people dying of starvation and the extinction of most species. I mean, I think this should really be described graphically, and even I can't fully wrap my head around it to describe it to you. I'm trying to give you an inkling of what these feedback loops start doing. They all contribute to each other, and we sort of pray that some of the feedback loops will counteract this as well. So um, the, the forecast for the temperature in Italy, uh, northern Italy, for example, is, is extremely hot. So Italy is not going to be even inhabitable practically. But on the other hand, in India, there's going to have massive amounts of rain in certain parts. So... Um, uh, not describing what we're in for uh, in these debates is a bad idea. People need to understand it's not as just an abstraction, but what it really means. And also in terms of uh, sea level rise, if these things start to pick up steam and they're going faster than the models have suggested, and the scientific community is conservative, so they're giving us information that's far too conservative about what the changes are going to be. But, you you know, we could see half of Florida, for example, underwater uh, within the next 10 years. Um, and uh, so the data is coming in that it's, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, the um, slippage of ice in Greenland is much higher than they predicted in Antarctica. It's much higher than they predicted. And um, th this, is, I'm glad that most of the people at the debate. Okay, so enough about uh, Armageddon one, which is climatic Armageddon, um, and back to the candidate. So, um, so Marianne Williamson was a very interesting uh, lady at this uh, debate, um, describing sort of the um, she was like the spiritual candidate for president. Um, and I felt like they pre-arranged that they would push all the interesting questions about uh, the progressive position to Elizabeth Warren instead of to Bernie Sanders. It seemed like she got more time and, she, and it was focused on making her the progressive standard bearer. And she was very convincing, but her track record is more problematic. I mean, Bernie has been very consistent, and Elizabeth Warren, until the mid-90s, was a Republican. Um, she has not been as uh, careful about the military-industrial complex as Bernie. Uh, so this country, in my opinion, as a democracy, ended on November 23rd, 1963, when JFK was murdered by the military and the intelligence of the United States because he was going to disband the CIA. This is proven fact. He wrote a policy paper that uh, the CIA should be moved into control of the army because the CIA is essentially a criminal organization that's legal. They're allowed to lie, cheat, and steal, kill secretly. You know, James Bond has his famous license to kill. Uh, and so we've allowed a criminal organization to emerge, and uh, Harry Truman... Uh, wrote a letter to the Washington Post. It was pulled from the newsstands, all the issues that had this letter in it, saying he would have never allowed the CIA to become what it became. And um, this is, uh, in my opinion, until we have a real truthful reconciliation about what happened in the 60s, killing Kennedy, then killing his brother, killing Martin Luther King, 
those were all definitely related to the government and the using the mafia and um, and so who are the you know the guys who run the CIA is basically the you can depict the secret government as really emanating from the people on the Council on Foreign Relations. It's not an identical group, but it's it's a fairly good way to find who is actually the steering committee of the deep state and the secret government. So, um, so uh, you know, I think Elizabeth Warren was set up to look better than Bernie in the debate, uh, and I'm. Uh, not 100 percent sure what makes her tick, and uh, and her uh, so far, I haven't seen her say much about the uh, military-industrial complex, and this group has inflicted measureless suffering on the world. Uh, so you know, a million people died in Indonesia that were murdered for being communist, whether they were or not. Certainly, I think that everyone has the right to their own political opinions, and if you want to be a communist, that's your right. It shouldn't be. So terrifying. It's only terrifying to the ruling class. To be a communist means that you don't believe in a system where a small elite controls all the resources. Now, you may be overly idealistic or you may be a manipulator, but there's nothing disrespectable about having a communist philosophy or an anarchist philosophy. Those are uh, just points of view people have based on uh, philosophers and economists and the like. So, uh, you know, in Indonesia, uh, so, you know, once they killed Kennedy, uh, these interventions ramped up greatly. Eisenhower did a lot of them, but there's not a single country that didn't have a charismatic, intelligent, saintly figure who arose who wasn't murdered by the CIA. So you've got Sukarno in Indonesia, and I learned about him from Noam Chomsky when I was 13 years old. I read his books. Uh, You've got uh, Allende in Chile. You had Joulart, or his nickname was Django, in Brazil. These were saintly people um, that were uh, wanted to rise the standards of the poor, uh, shoe the, the shoeless, uh, educate the illiterate. Um, and the ruling class doesn't want to have a classless society. Uh, and this is really evidenced by Jeffrey Epstein. So Jeffrey Epstein was able to get a lot of sexual gratification from girls uh, because of his money and power. If we lived in a in a egalitarian society where everybody had basically the same resources, uh, not, I'm not s uh, trying to say that you should agree with this, but if that existed, there would be no Jeffrey Epsteins taking advantage of girls. There would be. Uh, uh, the whole idea of prostitution would be completely turned on its head in a society where people had more or less similar, um, uh, uh, e an equal society. And um, so to me, it's very important where these people stand on foreign policy. And I'm very gratified that everybody's talking about ending endless war. Um, I think I started using end endless war hashtag early on in the online community. And now I hear something that I was the only person tweeting at one point, um, spoken on the stage by everyone. And we've got George Soros getting together with the Koch brothers to found a foundation to end endless war. But what will they do if they lose access to a market? Uh, how are they going to restore their access? So. If a country like uh, Venezuela dis decided that they were not going to let in multinational corporations or they were going to severely regulate them, so let's say they're not going to use war anymore, what are they going to use? Assassination? Are they going to use propaganda? Are they going to uh, create um, honey pots where they suck these men into sexual pecadillos uh, or women and then discredit them? Uh, so it's not enough to and endless war, that's good, but what are the tools they're going to use to get what they want? They're not doing endless wars, and this wasn't obviously discussed and never will be on corporate media, which returns the question of can't we have at least one debate that isn't chaired by one of these large multinational corporations, uh, like we had with the League of Women Voters, 
I think Democratic voters and or Republican voters, independent voters, should demand that, it, that these debates not be run by the networks. The debates should be run by independent groups and the network should carry them. And one factor is these independent groups wouldn't necessarily have people with all with a net worth of $10 million, uh, but be people that actually have these problems. The, for, for Chris Cuomo and uh, uh, Anderson Cooper and um, David Axelrod and all of these people on stage, with the possible exception of one or two, these are all people that are in the elite. They don't have the problems of regular people. They don't have the problems of a small business person. So I guess I would say that in terms of um, policies, Elizabeth Warren did the best job of articulating policies, but I don't agree with their policies. Their policies in many cases are um, not clear. I, I think Bernie should have made it clearer that free college, so to speak, is a normal factor. You, can, you as an American, if you go to Germany, can have free college in Germany. I think it was Beto O'Rourke who said that his college plan, which would be more targeted, would not just include tuition, but would include being able to uh, live. And so this was my problem when I was growing up, was that it was impossible for me to complete each semester of school and work full time. And, if, and, if, and if the tuition wasn't the problem. The problem was keeping a roof on my head. I was in community college. so. Um, so I think that the, the you know this, the, the back and forth was illuminating and could lead to moving everyone. So you know if these business guys saying let us use incentives, let us use a private sector, uh, and and you know uh, these ideas should swirl around as well. Um, so I thought the debate was good. I thought Bernie made it clear he was the most authentic, the most trustworthy to actually get the job done. Uh, some of the guys like Beto O'Rourke and Pete Buttigieg were too murky on their policies. Why did they want to only go a third of the way or halfway? What's the point? Because they're not looking at it from a perspective, uh, international perspective, comparing us to countries like Germany and France um, and other industrialized democracies, New Zealand, Australia, um, where um, these things are normal. Um, we have an abnormal country. We were the first, uh, one of the first, to develop a, um, a democratic system, but that meant we also had sort of a version 1.0 constitution. So we can't have more than two parties. We do not get to vote for any federal official except the president. Why shouldn't we be able to vote for other people? The fed well, we have our senators. Um, uh, but the uh, the in an ideal system, people could pick people they actually liked rather than just be presented with two candidates and hold their nose and pull the lever for the person that bothers them the, the least. So why couldn't you uh, have a hundred candidates to choose from uh, for Senate? Just pick whichever and, and not have them bound by district. Districts make it, it's like a divide and conquer when you have a uh, senator districts and uh, congressional districts. It makes it impossible for people to actually vote for anyone they actually like. Whereas if you had a more like a parliamentary system, you could vote for people you really liked and they would end up getting in Congress. And um, it's beyond the scope tonight to describe this. Um, but we, we have a 1.0 democracy. And, uh, and I think Pete Gutigig hinted at that, that why don't we have the balls to talk about a constitutional convention. Um, so that's what I have to offer tonight. Um, thank you for listening, and good night and good luck.